In this lesson, we're going to talk about the war at home, or how World War I really affected Americans in America. Because we know the war took place over in Europe, but a lot of things happened in the United States to help the cause. This was just a huge effort in the United States, and one of the first things that had to happen was the economy had to be shifted to the war effort. Previously, the government had been practicing laissez-faire, or hands-off, but President Wilson gained more control over the economy as the war went on. He then had the ability to fix different prices and to regulate war-related industries, because things had to be switched over from what they were previously making in order to help control supplies for the war effort. One group that was created out of this was the WIB, or the War Industries Board. The WIB was established in 1917 and then reorganized in 1918 under Bernard M. Baruch. The WIB encouraged companies to use mass production techniques to increase their efficiency. They needed to make more faster, and mass production really helped with that. Um, industry at this time increased by nearly 20% because of mass production, but retail prices went up really high as well. Um, different uh, ad administrations like the Railroad Administration and the Fuel Administration also controlled their sectors of the economy. Americans were practicing things like gasless Sundays and lightless nights in order to conserve resources for the war. They didn't want to waste the resources that needed to be used by our soldiers overseas. Um, out of this we also got daylight savings time because it was a way to get longer days of light in the summer so we didn't have to waste the fuel and the energy to light our homes. Um, wages were rising during the war but remember, prices were also really high. So although they were getting paid more, it didn't make life a whole lot better at, in that aspect. Um, some industrial workers were exempt from the draft because we needed them to be working in the industries. But this was also a way that Wilson could keep them happy with management because we've already looked at a lot of the different strikes and a lot of the diff different labor unions in the past. But Wilson said that you could either work or fight, meaning if you were disputing with your management you could lose your exemption of the war which a lot of people wanted and that was kind of initiated by the war labor board in 1918 we also had the food administration ran by herbert hoover the, mo the food administration practiced um, their motto called gospel of the clean plate where you would have days of the week where people would go without certain items so we could preserve them for the war we would have meatless sweetless wheatless and porkless days that the people would observe. Homeowners even planted things called victory gardens so they could grow their own food so they didn't have to be wasteful. It seems as I talk about these things like it would be rather kind of expensive and it was. The war itself costed 35.5 billion dollars. The government was able to raise one-third of this money through taxes and the rest was raised through war bonds. And as we look at these things, it's hard to th think how people in the United States would feel about it. Because, you know, some people weren't a huge fan of going to war, and others didn't want to see their lifestyle change that drastically. And so there's a lot of groups committed to convincing the public that the war was the right thing. One of these groups was the Committee on Public Information, or the CPI. And they're known as a propaganda agency. And if you don't know what propaganda is is it's a biased communication designed to influence people's thoughts and actions. So it's people really trying to convince people of something. And a former muckraker, so you know a muckraker would be good at convincing people, George Creel was the head of the department. This department used things like paintings, posters, cartoons, and sculptures promoting the war. And they also promoted patriotism, trying to be proud of your country. But there's a problem with that. Too much patriotism can also encourage hatred and violence of other groups. Immigrants from Germany and Austria-Hungary were really kind of being violated, and they saw a lot of hate groups forming against them at, during this time. German immigrants in the U.S. ended up losing jobs. Towns with German names were changed, and music by German composers just weren't played anymore. There was also some, some odd things that happened because of this newfound German hatred, like German measles became Liberty measles. Hamburgers became Salisbury steak. Sauerkraut became Liberty cabbage. And even Dachshunds, the dogs, became Liberty pups. So it's obvious that if you were in the United States, you really did not want to be disloyal to the U.S. during the war. 
and there were things that came out about that. And one of them was the Espionage and Sedition Acts of 1918. What this said is you could be fined up to $10,000 or spend 20 years in jail if you said anything disloyal, profane, or abusive about the government or its war effort. So if you were in the United States during this time, you probably wanted to be pretty in tune with the government and you wanted to go along with the war effort. But there's still some of those groups that weren't happy with the government at this time, such as the African Americans and the women. African Americans had been um, they had been subject to this racist government for a long time and women still hadn't had their right to vote yet, so they weren't sure what they were going to do. The blacks especially were divided among this. W.E.B. Du Bois, he supported the war because he thought if the African Americans could help, social justice would come a lot sooner than if they didn't. But there was another guy named William Monroe Trotter who thought, we've been victims of racism so long we cannot support this racist government. World War I did bring about a thing called the Great Migration, though. This was a large-scale movement of hundreds of thousands of southern blacks to northern cities. This happened for kind of a lot of different reasons. The Great Migration happened because of a lot of racial discrimination that was still happening in the South. Um, there was a boll weevil infestation and floods that ruined cotton fields. And World War I saw a drop in European immigration. And we know that those European immigrants worked a lot in the factories. But since they weren't coming over as frequently, there was more jobs for the African Americans in the North. Like I said, women were also kind of conflicted about what to do during this war effort, but really a lot of them pitched in and became railroad workers, cooks and dock workers, and also like bricklayers. And these were all jobs that men held before they went off to the war. We still needed these type of employees, but with our men gone, the women had to step up. And by them doing this, it really helped their cause for women's suffrage. And eventually the 19th Amendment was passed because of the women's role during World War One.